history of Hindu law reform and the stalemate over the Uniform Civil Code. In popular perception, the, polit the political stalemate on the Uniform Civil Code and reform of Muslim personal law started at the time of Shabanu controversy when Rajiv Gandhi as Prime Minister enacted the Retrogressive Muslim Women Protection of Rights of Divorce Act in 1986 to overturn the Supreme Court judgment delivered by Justice Chandrachud, which ruled that Muslim women were entitled to getting maintenance from their husbands after divorce under Section 125 of the Indian Penal Code. But Rajiv Gandhi was neither the first nor the last Prime Minister to have polarized India on communal lines through ill-advised political interventions. The divisive politics over this issue began with ham-handed attempts by our erstwhile colonial rulers to codify and impose a curious Anglo-Shastric hybrid of Hindu law for use in colonial courts. The attempt to codify law, Hindu law was begun in the late 18th century because the British rulers wanted to bring under their jurid judicial purview all the aspects of social and political life of diverse communities of India as part of Pax Britannica. But strangely enough, they kept away from codifying Muslim personal law while giving it full sanctity through the enactment of the Muslim Personal Law Shariat Application Act of 1937. This in effect meant that the Muslim clergy were given a free hand to interpret Muslim personal law in the most retrogressive manner under the guise of safeguarding their religious freedom. This divisive agenda was provided much greater sanctity by the doyen of Indian secularism, namely Jawaharlal Nehru himself, when in the very first day, decade after independence, Nehru chose to put the entire weight of his government in reforming only Hindu customary laws on the basis of poorly understood and half-baked knowledge of the vast diversity that prevailed in India with regard to Hindu customary practices while refusing to touch Muslim and Christian personal laws. And one reason why condensing it has been so difficult is because my paper, the original one and the one that's expanding, contains brilliant gems of Nehruvian idiocy. Uh, so, you know, I just couldn't tempt including them all, but I know I don't have the time, so I've had to. <laughs> the Englishmen who initially came as traders to India began to feel befuddled at the vast diversity and complexity of social practices among Hindu communities because that made the task of ruling India too difficult. During Warren Hastings' tenure as the head of the Supreme Council of Bengal, began a new kind of study of ancient Shastras to help the British develop a set of rules for governing the alien society they were determined to rule. To quote Duncan Derrett, Hastings and his colleagues assumed that just as the European marriage laws were based on biblical tenets, so must the personal laws of various communities in India draw their legitimacy from some fundamental religious tenets of the Hindus. In reality, there, were no there was no authoritative text or the equivalent of a pope among Hindus to pronounce a uniform code for all the diverse communities of India, no Shankaracharya, whose writ ran all over the country. But that did not prevent the British from searching. An even bigger mistake of the British was that at this point they took no steps to collect evidence of local or caste custom. This led to wide discrepancies between the opinions or reports of pundits hired by them to assist different courts. Often same pundits gave different opinions on similar matters. In order to arrive at a definitive grasp of the Indian, the Hindu, legal system, the East India Company began to train pundits for its own service and began to patronize Shastric education. This included setting up of a Sanskrit college at Banaras and at Calcutta. In 1772, Hastings hired a group of 11 pundits for the purpose of creating a digest of Hindu law. This was a made-to-order text in which the pundits followed the authority of their paymasters. The use of Sanskrit scholars to interpret the customary laws for the benefit of courts inevitably brought in a heavy Anglo-Brahmanical bias. This work was translated into Persian and from Persian into English and thereafter made mincemeat of. In March, 9, in seven, in March 70, 
1775, Hastings sent this work to London with a preface on its cultural background and was printed there under the title A Code of Gentu Hindus or Ordinations of the Pandits. This could be called the first serious, though far from accurate, attempt at codification of Hindu law for the use of British judges. This codification could not put an end to conflicting opinions. This led the British to increasingly mistrust the Pandit, feeling that the latter were misleading the court or that they favored the interests of their own caste. The resulting confusions led William Jones to work on a more definitive code of Hindu law comparable with Justinian's corpus juris. Uh, he was determined, and I quote, the British should administer to the Indian people the best Shastric law that could be discovered. It's like Nehru's discovery of India, and was determined to free the British from their dependence on the pundits. To quote William Jones, I can no longer bear to be at the mercy of our pundits who deal out Hindu law as they please and make it at reasonable rates when they cannot find it ready-made. But there wasn't any ready-made law. So if you ask them to do the impossible, what else do you expect? Um, Jones then went on to translate Manusmriti, which became one of the most favored texts of the British. It influenced Oriental studies in the West far more profoundly than it had ever influenced the administration of law or social practice in British India. After Jones, Colebrook tried his hand at a similar compilation. In a few years' time, Colebrook's translation of the Mitakshara and the Dyabhaga became the two most frequently quoted and relied upon sources in court judgments. In the meantime, several Sanskrit scholars had attempted to write legal treatises to meet the British demand. Nevertheless, the work of European authors on Shastrik law came to be trusted and used in preference to the work of even genuine Sanskrit scholars. Thus grew the myth that Hindus were governed by Shastrik injunctions. And these new law codes, backed by the authority of British courts, began to make alterations in custom, even when the British law provided for protection of the latter. Since then, Hindu customary practices have been forced to struggle against Anglo-Shastric law, brought into existence at the behest of the British, assuming it to be personal law of Hindus. This ossified Anglo-Hindu law is what the Indian parliament set out to reform in the first decade of Indian independence. The Congress was, at that time, dominated by lawyers trained in British law. The foremost warriors for reforming Hindu law, Nehru and Ambedkar, had studied law in England. They had consequently imbibed all the colonial biases regarding the functioning of Indian society, as well as changes that were supposedly needed to modernize it. This is a major reason that the reformed Hindu law is in conformity with reforms initiated during British rule. The process of drafting Hindu Code Bill began in the 1940s after a long and checkered history. It was presented to the legislature in 47 and referred to a select committee headed by the then law minister, Dr. Ambedkar, in 1948. The Congress itself was sharply divided on the issue and it created a tremendous furor both inside and outside parliament. In the face of this opposition from within and without, the government finally decided to split the bill into four parts, which is how we know it now. Um, Hindu Marriage Act, Hindu Succession Act, Hindu Adoption and Maintenance, uh, Guards and Wardian, you know, I'll come to each one of them later. Um, covering maintenance, divorce, adoption, guardianship, um, and property, inheritance, etc. Thus, in 1948, Dr. B. V. Keskar, Constituent Assembly member from UP, remarked on Doc Dr. Medkar's bill, quote, I do not think there has been any bill so radical and so revolutionary, which is trying to change the very foundations of Hindu society, a task that, by the way, the British failed to do as successfully as Nehruvian um, elite did, a society which has remained fossilized for the last thousand years. You can see the colonial bias in this. This rhetoric functioned in two ways. First, it projected a myth that Indian women were absolute, 
absolutely equal under the new laws. Second, the rhetoric put a thick veil over the fact that the rights being bestowed were far from equal and for women of many communities, and that's really important, the Hindu reformed law took away far more than it gave. Actually, the rights were curtailed. But the rhetoric was really high for Lutin and Flowery. Thus, on May 10, 1956, the Hindustan Times carried an advertisement for GPCP's film, Srimati Charsubis, which proclaimed, I quote, red letter day in the history of social reform. Parliament passes in Hindu succession bill and removes age old injustice to women. Here is a picture to uphold these ideas which blazes a new trail in revolutionary social dramas. So again, that typical hyperbole, Nehruvian, ne you know, everything they were doing was so radical, so revolutionary, so modern, etc. Now, why this insistence on uniformity in Hindu law? In the vein of British distaste for polytheism and glorification of monotheism as somehow intrinsically morally superior, the Nehruvian modernists had similar disdain for the diversity and complexity of Hindu society. The self-styled progressives perceived themselves as modernizing woodcutters, wielding the axe against the mystifying jungle of Hindu law. The destructive metaphor of cutting down trees rooted in the earth is a revealing one. Again, I quote Dr. B. V. Keskar, the present day Hindu law is a maze. It's a jungle like the Tarais or the Sundarbans in which all sorts of practices and traditions come up. The time has come when this maze of traditions and counter traditions should be put an end to and we must rationalize and consolidate the law. And all those who questioned the wisdom of the kind of laws that were being uh, project, uh, proposed were dismissed as reactionaries. To quote Kameshwar Singh, a Congress MP from Bihar, who tried to defend the existing diversity of India, saying, the diversity perceptible in different parts of the country goes a great way in establishing the fact that popular acceptance and not imposition from any central political authority has been the sanction behind the personal law of Hindus. We should not take the seeming diversity as an evil which must be instantaneously removed. And mind you, the, the Nehruvians of today accuse the BJP and RSS of doing what they did so successfully, which is destroy diversity in favor of some imaginary uniformity that they want to, to impose. Dr. Ambedkar was among those most enamored of states' right to dominate civil society. I quote him, some communities like the Hindu community needed the reform so badly, it was a slum clearance. He also argued that customary law amounted to anarchy and that it had evolved only because India lacked parliament. Brilliant logic. The contempt for Indian society labeled backward, uncivilized and degenerate is a recurring theme in all his interventions. I quote again. This society is an inert society. The Hindu society has always believed that lawmaking is the function of either of God or Smriti, and that Hindu society has no right to change the law. Society has never accepted its own power and its own responsibility in molding its social, economic, and social life. It is for the first time. I mean, this is so contrary to what was actually happening on, on the ground. The truth is that the entire reform process was based on the flawed assumption that Hindus blindly followed their Shastras and hence remained backward. In reality, none of the Shastras or Smritis ever issued commandments, as do the foundational texts of Abrahamic religions. The Smritis are, to this audience I don't need to say all this, but the Smritis are a collection of precepts written by Rishis, all of who stress the importance of custom and usage over any textual authority. Justice Desai, in his authoritative introduction to Mullah's treatise on Hindu law, says that much of the traditional law of ancient India would be termed as morality because that law was not a direct or circuitous command of a monarch or sovereign to persons in a state of subjection to its author. Even Dharma Shastras are not religious texts in the way Bible and Quran are, 
Dharma itself means the aggregate of duties and obligations, religious, moral, social, and legal of a person in his or her diverse roles. Um, dharma is meant to be situation and time specific as well as person and place specific rather than an immutable set of laws. And the authority to change or start new custom to, uh, lies not just with the biradri but also with the kula or the family. To quote Narad Smriti, custom is all powerful and overrides the sacred law. I mean all this explains why Hindus have proven so difficult to govern. They, no matter what laws you pass, they mind, find a way to subvert them and continue with their life um, as before. Manu Smriti, which was provided the halo of final authority by the British stresses, I quote, a king must inquire into the law of castes, of districts, of guilds, and of families, and settle the peculiar law of each. And goes on to add, thus have the holy sages, well knowing that law is grounded on a memorial custom, embraced as the root of all piety, good usages long established. It is noteworthy that none of the smritikars pick up kajals with or deny the authority of other smritikars in an attempt to prove that theirs is the most authoritative version of a single code of conduct. Instead, they assume that the various codes should coexist, not challenging each other. Um, for instance, the Smriti of Ryajna Valkya gives a list of 20 sages as lawgivers. The Mitakshra explains that the enumeration is only illustrative and other dharam sutras are not excluded. There is no attempt to assign a hierarchical order to the authority of their authors and an oft-repeated maxim that was that reason and justice are to be given more regard than mere text. Try finding reason and justice in modern Indian laws and you'll go mad. For instance, the highly revered author of Apastamba Sutra from South India takes care to impress on his pupils, I quote, some declare that the remaining duties which have not been taught here must be learned from women and men of all castes. And goes on to add, the knowledge which women possess is the completion of all study. So we really were never um, subject to divine commandments coming through any prophet, speaking on the name of God, etc., etc. And the Gautam Dharam Sutra and many others do lay down the injunction that the king is duty bound to preserve the time honored institutions and usages of different communities, cultivators, traders, etc. And this distinguished Hindu society from those which adhere to the idea that the word of God came to them in the form of a sacred text and they must obey it unconditionally. Gandhi is one of the few modern social reformers to have under, understood this simple principle. By this means, he could propose a radical agenda of social reform for all communities seeking sanction from no extrinsic authority and initiate a far-reaching campaign for radical social reform, declaring nothing in the Shastras which is manifestly contrary to universal truths and morals can stand. Nothing in the Shastras which is capable of being reason can stand if it is in conflict with reason. And goes on to add, my belief in the Hindu scriptures does not require me to accept every word and every verse as divinely inspired. I decline to be bound by any interpretation, however learned it may be, if it is repugnant to reason or moral sense. Try using this formula for our modern day laws and you will end up in Tihar Jail. This continues to be, in some essential ways, a living tradition in India. Each caste and subcaste and occupational grouping continues to assert its right to regulate its inner affairs uh, and does not pay much attention to either ancient textual authorities um, um, in the sense of being literalist or modern parliament enacted laws. When a person or group in India seek to defend a particular practice or resist following something being proposed, the common statement one hears across the country is, Hamari to aise hi hota hai. That's it. You know, this is how we do things in our community. Nobody says, you must do it also, the world must follow. Um, this wisdom, again, as I said, has come to us from the West, 
and the modern uh, uh, modernizers of Indian society who think everybody must obey one kind of dictate which they issue um, and which can you know be as arbitrary as any. In direct contravention of the genius of indigenous practices, the British rulers through the Privy Council had laid down that only such customs would be recognized in law as were ancient, observed without interruption, uniform, obligatory, and not immoral or opposed to public policy. Now, knowing full well the Victorian sense of morality, you can well imagine how horrified they were by matrilineal family systems here, by women leading much freer lives in most parts of India than they were used to in Victorian England. Um, so everything that didn't match with their Victorian notions of morality and patriarchal control of the family was obviously declared immoral. And Ambedkar also follows the same logic by saying, what are we doing? We are shutting down the growth of new customs. We are not destroying existing customs. So existing customs are those that the British had ossified. So the Indian legislature thus completed the process begun by the Privy Council of trying to homogenize and stultify customary practices, which were forever evolving as per the changing requirements of time and imposed on it norms of their own devising. For instance, the Maharashtra school was in certain respects the most liberal of the different schools of Hindu law in giving recognition to the rights of women. The founder of this school, Nil Kantabhatta, does not merely present traditional solutions, but suggests that he evaluates them keeping in view the current, current needs of society. Even though in the early years the law courts took this school seriously, it slowly was eclipsed in favor of more conservative schools, and this happened to most of the liberal schools um, of Hindu law by, when the parliament went on to so-called reform it. These court judgments by Victorian judges over time became more authoritative than the Shastras from whom they supposedly derived their authority. This too added an unprecedented rigidity to Hindu law. The numerous High Court, Supreme Court, and Privy Council decisions gave rise to a mass of case law which came to supersede not only customary usages but the Shastri, Shastric texts on which they claimed to base the pronouncements. So they came to decide which part of Shastra they're willing to accept, not, and they are the final judges. Once the British courts took over, it meant they translated and often mistranslated certain texts, arbitrarily rejected some, including those that favored women, and decided disputes in a way they took power completely out of people's hands. So this hapless society being governed by Dili Darbar, you know, is something we still continue. And now, uh, the British at least used to make a pretense of consulting uh, civil society when they tried to enact laws. They actually went through very elaborate process. Um, today, um, a few select Delhi-based foreign-funded NGOs have come to substitute for civil society. And none of us even know what's being enacted um, on our behalf. Now, I'm going to give a few illustrative examples of how uh, the Hindu code bill and the various four laws that were passed by splitting it into parts um, actually was, a, in many ways, a backward-moving journey. By the time it was passed in 55, the Hindu Marriage Act had undergone enormous changes. Its original provision for civil marriage had been removed and separately passed under the Special Marriage Act. Its major innovation related to the enforcement of monogamy and uniform provisions for dissolution of marriage of, for all castes. Monogamy was generally accepted as desirable and widely preferred if not observed by all in practice. And Ramayana is all about how monogamy is a prefer preferable form of marriage than a polygamous marriage. The main objection to enforcement of monogamy through law sprang from resentment at Muslims being allowed for wives. However, around the provision for dissolution of marriage, the debates were really revealing. Nehruvian's reforms borrowed lock, stock, and barrel 
the British notion of marriage dissolution. In a desire to adhere to the biblical dictum, what God hath enjoined together, let no man put asunder, English law had, as it were, constructed a series of steps on the way to complete dissolution and had also provided for backtracking, hence the provision for void, voidable marriage, restitution of conjugal rights, etc., etc. The reformers mistakenly thought that divorce was being introduced for the first time in Hindu society, even though they were repeatedly told that formal divorce existed even among large sections, uh, not even, among, it, it, it existed among large sections of the population and de facto divorce even among the upper caste who claimed in theory that marriage among them was indissoluble. And uh, actually it's very humbling to read the parliamentary debates of that time. The quality of interventions by a large number of people, far better informed, I don't think we have anything comparable happening in parliament today. It's th today's parliament is like Arnab Goswami show. Um, despite being reminded repeatedly over the years that legal divorce would be inaccessible to most people, unless efficient institutions were established for this purpose, the government took no steps to do so. Each time the divorce provisions were discussed in Parliament, this point was raised time and again. In 1951, for example, Babu Ram Narayan Singh of Bihar said, in 90% of the society we know that divorce is a daily routine. Two, four, or five of them sit together, both the contending parties come and they break some stalk of grass and their mutual relations are broken. This constituted divorce. Not a penny was to be incurred on this or any botheration whatsoever. Now all of them will have to go to the district judge for divorce. What a lot of expenditure and bother it will, this whole procedure will mean. He then went on to remark that the effect of passing such laws without creating an effective implementation machinery would be that people would ignore them and continue to rely on their own institutions. To quote him again, we have panchayats and panchas, and since in our country custom and usages are pliable, this will continue to hold good and people would accept them automatically. What the, note this, what the country thinks and what she needs, government never worry about. The government go on spending money lavishly, go on passing baseless and futile laws against the will of the public. Dr. Pandey of Uttar Pradesh gave a graphic account of how the government worked to harass rather than to help people. Let me quote him. They do not have enough money even to try ordinary cases, which are pending for several months. Now it's several decades. In this country, unfortunately, whenever a citizen comes into contact with government machinery, he's subjected to vexations at every step. An ordinary citizen finds it difficult even to get a ration card. Do you think it'll be easy to get a divorce certificate in a court of law for a person who's ignorant and poor? People manage their own affairs in an automatic manner. You wish to take upon yourself a responsibility which you, for which you're not prepared. In contrast, I mean, the customary Indian practice of dissolution of marriage went through no, none of these stages that the Indian divorce law introduced. The negotiations were conducted by the Biradari Panchayats. We all know even today, um, uh, only a microscopic number of disputes, family disputes, end up in courts because they are solved uh, within the community by two sides bringing in trusted elders. In the Marumakutyam system prevalent in parts of the south with matrilineal family system, women could actually unilaterally call off the relationship without need for formal sanction of any panchayat. The worst aspect of the Hindu Marriage Act is that it imposed the notion of adversarial divorce along with the, mind, with the mindset that divorce should be made as difficult as possible. Both these nations were again imported from uh, Victorian Britain. The lawmakers failed to draw on indigenous systems of divorce in framing the law uh, because of their contempt for it, um, especially those from the South. The ignorance and arrogance vis-a-vis -vis the South is truly mind-blowing. 
For example, S.P. Mukherjee of West Bengal, speaking against the bill, expressed typically cavalier disregard of the alternative systems available in the South. I quote him. Somebody said that South India was specially progressive and many of the laws which we are considering are already in existence there today. I say good luck to South India. Let South India proceed from progress to progress, from divorce to divorce. Why force it on others who do not want it? I mean, these are the kind of arguments. Several members of parliament pointed out that the framers of Hindu Marriage Act were mistaken in thinking that British notions and practices were more advanced than Indian ones. To quote... Pandit S.C. Mishra. There are certain people who think that they have brought forward a very progressive measure. It is certainly not more progressive than what you see around you. It is just like the foreigners who come to India and said, you Hindus are in darkness. We are bringing you out into enlightenment. In an incisive and well-reasoned speech, a supporter of the bill, Dr. Jay Surya of Medak pointed out, the Honorable Minister's ministry evidently did not know where to look for divorce clauses. They possibly thought there's nothing in our ancient system. I say there is Katayana and several others. Narad and Kautilya had allowed dissolution after three years of disappearance and Kautilya had allowed for divorce by mutual consent whenever there is mutual hatred between husband and wife. And he goes on to add, the Europeans considered British social laws as extremely reactionary, but we, are, we for generations have been influenced by British jurisprudence. If you cannot find in our ancient laws, by our own thinking, reasonable provisions for divorce, then you might as well copy from other countries. Scandinavia, for instance, is far more advanced than Britain, which is uh, you know, actually true even today. He also pointed out, you know, and then he adds how the traditional law had much more stronger provisions against cruelty to wife and safety of women in marriage, etc. I don't have time to read those brilliant quotes. Another example of North Indian bias is the primacy given to Saptapadi. All of you who've read the Hindu Marriage Act would know marriage is complete only when the uh, sat peras or char peras completed. The mindless love for uniformity is to be seen in matters other than divorce. Srimati Sushma Sen, a supporter of the bill, replying to a query from a Kerala member, Sri VP Nair, as to why Saptapadi should be considered necessary for a val valid marriage when many other forms of marriage were perhaps more widely prevalent, for example, in Maramakutyam marriage which were contracts, not sacraments, the ceremony consisted of a simple exchange of clothes. Now, oh my God. I'll uh, rush through. Give me 10. I'm glad to find, this is um, in response to those who are saying, please look at what we already have. I'm glad to find that only Saptapadi can form a complete marriage. This will be in conformity with the modern progressive society. Now, why is, how is it that Saptavadi is the only thing that's in conformity and all others are backward, etc.? You know, the process of creating greater uniformity resulted in annoying number of communities who expressed the desire to be exempted, such as Sikhs who do Anand Karaj, Kurgs, Veerashevas, among others. And I think the, the desire to opt out um, with different communities saying, we are not Hindu, please treat us as separate, is precisely because of this. Um, now, um, mischief in the Hindu Succession Act. Very quickly, I will not have time to deal with the other uh, two at all. But Hindu Succession Act, which was supposed to be the core, because without economic rights, inheritance rights, you don't have much worth in other laws. But despite original bill having done away with the idea of mitakshra co parsonary given only to, uh, fine, uh, only to males, the final product that came out, it retained mitakshra co parsonary system, which go, gave co parsonary rights by birth only to males, ruling out daughters. This was the most backward. Actually, it's worse than what the traditional mitakshra had, because there, the rights of even unborn children were protected, right to be maintained. This is gone. Also, co-parsoners' right to will away his interest in the joint family property. 
Um, and this was introduced very clearly in order to give fathers the right to disinherit daughters. And this is said openly. The law minister declares it openly in the parliament that if those you are upset that uh, you know, we are giving succession rights to daughters, but please remember we are giving you the right to will your property in favor of your sons or whoever and disinherit daughters. So a law ministers rarely tell, uh, pronounce in court how to uh, make nonsense of the law they are pa passing. And actually that's what calmed, calmed a lot of people down. But forgetting that the instrument of the will, traditional Hindu law of no variety, ever gives unlimited right to will away property because um, whoever is the head of the family is only supposed to manage it on behalf of others, not just gift it away, give it away, disinherit certain members. But this very un-Hindu provision was introduced in order to destroy the right, the existing rights of women among communities, a lot of them matrilineal. Today we only think of Kerala as matrilineal pocket, but that was not true in 19th century, even up to 20th century, or even up to when they're passing this. And all alteration of the original provision that a daughter would get a share equivalent to ha half the share of a son in self-acquired property. So even that is. So in the end, the daughters really got pitiful right in the original uh, Hindu Succession Act. And it took how many decades? In 2005, finally, uh, after much persuasion, the government was forced to bring women as co-partners. Uh, but interestingly, all the members of parliament who are opposing this are saying it very clearly that you are Nehruji, Ambedkarji, and all you big Gs, you're playing mischief with women. You are taking away with one hand what you're pretending to give with the other because you know very well this provision will be used only against daughters. But of course, this was not heeded. Now, I will, before I conclude, you know, I was talking about the North Indian bias. Um, uh, there's a hilarious um, interaction in Parliament when some members are talking about the fact that uh, women ought not to be, you know, deprived of rights, and those who were against giving, gi giving women strong inheritance rights said, how can you give right to daughters in parental family? Because in our country, they don't even drink water. Uh, this is how it was being justified why daughters should not have. But when, for example, Pandit Mukul Dihari Bhargav was arguing that no Hindu parent would want to inherit a daughter's property because um, the Sridhan could only be inherit by, inherited by in-laws, which was again very un-Hindu, which, which had not been the case earlier. Listen to this before I conclude very fast. Bharti says, why not, why not? What is the harm in um, parents, girls' parents inheriting the property from the daughter? Bhargav says, perhaps my honorable friend comes not from India, but from an outside country. Bharati, I come from south of India, Bhargav. In India, no father nor mother will ever think of receiving anything from the daughter, Bharti. That may be so in the Punjab, Bhargav. It is so in the whole of northern India. I cannot speak with authority about South India. In our part of the country, the father or mother will not even take water in the house of the daughter. Bharti says, it's not so bad in our part of the country, Bhargav says. That may be a customer usage prevalent in your part of the country, but in my part of the country, an overwhelming majority will abhor the idea. Therefore, the entire fabric of the rules of devolution is based on anti-Hindu ideals. So anything that didn't suit their agenda was anti-Hindu. And mind you, all, that, all the abuses that the seculars and the libtards uh, freely threw at all of us who opposed them were actually made fashionable right then. Any op opposition to this cockamamie, I mean, this you know, bizarre law, I don't have the time to give you more uh, of it. But in the end, uh, A, you can read the paper in Economic and Political Weekly in its earlier avatar, and then you'll soon, soon read it in an expanded form in a book that I'm publishing. 
uh, given the fact that the Hindu um, reform led to the most un-Hindu uh, uh, practices being, or un-Hindu principles being institutionalized. What it did though is that but gave the Hindu community a terrible sense of agreement that you don't dare touch Muslims, you don't dare touch, we are the only ones you ride roughshod over. And at the same time, it also made Muslims feel that they are above all laws and they are above even the constitution of India. And you see that stalemate acquire such a deadly, such a vicious form that today when even Muslim women are begging the Supreme Court to ban pol pol polygamy and halala and all these practices, the court dare not. You know, there have been uh, bing bong battles going on, you government do it, no, 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 we can't do it, no, no, court do it. You know, they, they, they don't have the guts to even handle it. Today, because they've allowed the polarization and the rigidification of the Muslim clergy to go unchecked in the last many decades. Now, for solution, very quickly, you know, uh, it's very unlikely that the government can actually enact a uniform civil code. And if it does, I don't trust this government to do much better um, in um, making, because if you go by past experience of anti dowry law, domestic violence, anti all these are ferocious, draconian, idiotic laws. So, what I suggest is the following. And this is something that was suggested even at that time. Why not just make it optional? Like in Hindu society, we've had so many different customary and shastric uh, traditions going on simultaneously. Don't claim infallibility and say one and one only. So also, I suggest that without bothering to act a, I think she's a compulsory she's civil court, all that the government needs to do is this have the secular courts of the country only use what is already. We already have Indian Succession Act, in Indian Marriage Act, Indian uh, Adoption and Guardianship Act. These secular laws are already there. Improve them still further if you need to and if you have the guts to. And then say, when you come to court of law, because this is a secular country, we will only give you Indian law for family affairs. Those of you who are happy with customary law, be it Hindu customary law, be it Marmakutyam, be it Deya Bhaga, whatever you wish to create for yourself, you can do so through your own respective community elders. Go to your Malvi, go to your Gurdwara uh, priest, go to anybody you wish to, or to Shankaracharya if you want personal law. But the court will only give you one law. Now, which means you're giving everybody, including the Muslims, the freedom to uh, preserve what they think is so precious for them. But then, with the provision that if even one party to the marriage is dissatisfied with what the communal, the, the personal law is offering, then that person can come to the court and say, my community law doesn't do justice, and therefore, please, I wish to be governed by Indian law. So then, the Muslim community can't say we are forcing a uniform civil code on them. If they can keep women happy, Muslim women happy, so be it. But those who are not, and those who wish to move out of the cage that has been constructed around them, can do so, and also Hindu community will hopefully be less supine. You know, we've allowed the government to run riot all over. Let's learn to take responsibility for ensuring that our family life is not only egalitarian, but gives dignified life to all, not just to young daughters-in-law, but to all members Shall of the family. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Madhu. We'll be able to take only two questions. Main purpose of these reforms in 1950s, as has been seen by other international juridical experts, has actually been to extinguish the role of Dharma Shastras 
in Indian dispute settlement. In fact, John Derrick wrote a book called Death of Dharma Shastra, mainly saying till then, in any dispute resolution, some Dharma Shastra had to be consulted or had to be quoted, not necessarily as an authority to settle the matter, but to get some idea of how this issue is to be looked upon. And I think what this was, what Ambedkar and Nehru did was to stop all further discussion on Dharma Shastra in Indian public jurisprudence life. Uh, I think the Indian people have gone on, and I don't think the passing of this law, not passing, has mattered to about 80-90% of our people. But uh, disputes are still there, and we don't know how to handle them. This is an extraordinarily draconian All India law that we have put for ourselves, and we are suffering by it. No, I haven't even talked to you about the laws, the draconian laws that followed. See, I, I, I agree with you about completely crushing that whole knowledge heritage, obliterating it. And with it came disdain for Sanskrit, for traditional studies, all of that, including our Bollywood films contributed to uh, making fun of people who were Sanskrit pundits or you know scholars. It, 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 so th that task was done very, very efficiently, no doubt. But I do think that custom, not just Dharma Shastra, which changes, you don't need the idea that I don't need any superior authority of your, that my head can also think justly. The whole idea of Panch Parmeshwar. I, I agree, but I'm saying it doesn't have to be textual alone. That's the point I'm trying to make. And all Dharma Shastras say that textual wisdom is not all that there is to it. Uh, I, exactly. I, I fully agree with you there. But the point that I'm trying to make, and I would like to add one bit, you know, when I said the easy solution is to offer Indian uh, Marriage Act, Indian with certain amendments, because this was passed many years ago, we should draw encouragement from the fact that Muslim women have been freely using the Dowry Prohibition Act and its draconian provisions to send their husbands to jail. They've been using the Domestic Violence Act. And they've been able to do so simply because it doesn't carry the tag Hindu. The moment you call it Hindu Marriage Act, then, and then the feminists now have started saying that uniform civil code will be Hinduization. Now, if we are able to say Hindus don't need Hindu uh, laws enacted by the government, those Hindus who really value are capable of handling them through their own systems. But when we go to court, we expect everybody to be treated equally. The moment you remove the tag Hindu, just as Muslim women have very freely and avidly make, made use of uh, dowry act, though the Muslims are not supposed to have dowry, but they're using it simply because it doesn't have the, So really, the answer is very simple. And I don't know why the government, I proposed it to the government in writing. I will uh, published on this. Uh, I do wish those of you who see virtue or worth, worth in it, please do get back. And let's bring this whole issue on track. Uh, instead of these very pitiful, half-hearted, frightened attempts at reforming Muslim personal law, where only issue at stake right now is instant triple talaq. Never mind, you can do it after three months. No mention of polygamy. No mention of many other halala, for example, which is truly one of the most abhorring practices. And this really takes care of it all. Thank you. <laughs>